So you're working on putting together a custom car audio system and you want to upgrade your speakers. Now you know that there's coaxial speakers like these shown on screen, but there's also these guys here, component speakers. Why would we want to go with component speakers? Do these sound better? What are the advantages and disadvantages of this type of speaker? What is this box that comes with the component speakers? How do we install them? All that and more is coming up my friends in this video all about component speakers. Hey, what's going on? I'm Mark. Welcome to Car Audio Fabrication. Here on this channel, we learn how to master car audio and how to design, build, and install our dream car audio system. I have a full library of videos. I have build blog videos, I have gear review videos, and I have videos like this one teaching you guys some knowledge. So if you enjoy that kind of thing, I hope that you'd consider subscribing. So what are component speakers? A component speaker is any speaker that isn't designed as an all-in-one standalone speaker to cover the full range of frequencies that we listen to. For instance, this is a six inch midwoofer. It's designed to play mid bass and some of the vocals, but this is a tweeter, which is better designed not to play bass, but only to play the high range of frequencies. Now component speakers can be bought individually, or you can buy them as a set when they're better designed to work together. Now there's different types of sets of component speakers as well. This is a two way set because it has the midwoofer and the tweeter, but you could also get a three-way set that has the midwoofer, a mid-range speaker, and a tweeter. So what are some of the advantages of a component set? The first advantage is location of these speakers in the vehicle, the flexibility that we have with doing a component set. As we know, the tweeters play the high range frequencies and these frequencies are usually a little bit more directional. So it's better to have these tweeters up high, more near the dash rather than down by our leg, firing directly into our shin. In contrast, larger speakers like these midwoofers will give us more bass performance, which is what they're designed for, if they're installed into a door, something with more air volume. The lower range frequencies aren't as directional, so it's not as big a deal if these are low down in the door firing into our legs. Now the other item that is usually included with a component set is this guy right here, the crossover. What this guy does is it's wired between our amplifier and our speakers. It takes a full range signal, which is 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, into it and it divides that up for our different speakers because we don't want our tweeters playing bass frequencies and vice versa. So this guy here divides up that signal and this is what we call a passive crossover. There's also active crossovers where you wouldn't necessarily need this. You can use the crossovers in your digital signal processor or in your amplifier, more on this later. So another advantage is the fact that we are splitting up the frequency ranges and sending them to two different speakers using the crossover. Why is it an advantage to have each of these speakers playing different frequency ranges. Well, one, for their protection. Obviously, a tweeter can't play subwoofer bass. It would blow up virtually immediately. Kaboom! But the other reason is even though it would be safe to send high frequencies through this larger speaker, it's going to distort the sound because now that speaker is trying to play a wide range of the different information in the music all at once. Additionally, playing high range frequencies through a larger speaker like this can lead to what we call beaming. In other words, if you are directly in front of the speaker, the sound is a lot different than if you're 45 degrees off axis of the speaker. And in a car environment, when we have a lot of different reflections off the windows and things like that, that's something that we generally want to try to avoid. And we can do so with only sending information to this speaker that won't allow it to beam. That was kind of a really basic explanation about beaming. If you want to learn more about that, you can check out that video up in the corner of the screen. Another benefit is we will get better imaging from our system. When we're sitting there and listening to the system, it's a lot easier to pick out each of the individual instruments within the recording. It sounds a lot more natural. It just sounds better because these are able to do what they're designed to do. The imaging and clarity is also enhanced by the fact that we can install these within different locations in the vehicle. We don't have to install them all in one spot. So let's talk about installation of these guys. Now the first question that I see come up quite often is people want to know, can you run a component set off an aftermarket head unit alone? Yes, you can, but ideally I think it's better if you also upgrade and get an aftermarket amplifier as well. Don't forget that we're now using two separate speakers on each side that can handle 
handle more power. So you're obviously gonna wanna look up the power requirements of the speakers, but odds are they would benefit from an aftermarket amplifier powering them. Now let's talk about the installation flexibility of using the crossover, or in this case, better defined as the passive crossover. We have two different options. We can keep this thing and we run the signal into it out of the amplifier and then we connect the speakers to it or we can get rid of it and do what's called running active. So first off, why would we potentially want to keep this? Well, this does have some degree of tweeter protection inside. What that means is if we accidentally send a base frequency signal out of our amplifier and into this, it's gonna filter it out and protect that tweeter. But if this tweeter is directly connected to our amplifier and we're using the crossover on a digital signal processor or on that amplifier itself and that crossover fails, we no longer have this protection in line. Another advantage of this is let's say I'm using an amplifier that only has two available channels. So I have a left side and a right side. A two-way component set is gonna have two midwoofers, it's gonna have two tweeters, but it's also going to have two crossovers, which means I can run one channel into this and one channel into this, but I can then connect four speakers total, two on each of these. So I'm effectively using two channels from the amplifier to power four different speakers and still dividing up that signal, which is an advantage of keeping these. If I wanted to run two tweeters and two woofers, so a pair on each side of the vehicle, and I was going to go active and not use that passive crossover, I'd be required to have four channels from the amplifier. So those are the advantages. What are some disadvantages of using the passive crossover? Well, this thing will actually Actually eat up some of the amplifier power that is going to your speakers. But please, please, please don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I've mentioned that fact before that these eat up a little bit of power and then I use them in a project and a lot of people are like, oh, those eat up all the power. Why are you using them, Mark? It's still okay to use these. It really depends on the system. If you have plenty of amplifier power, there's no problem with using these, especially if you need to retain those number of channels that you're using, like we mentioned earlier. But with that said, another disadvantage of keeping the passive crossover is we lose some tuning flexibility. So let's say that we have a digital signal processor connected in front of the amplifier and then the amplifier to this. And if you guys don't know what a DSP is, check out this video here. If we do have that DSP to control time alignment, but we're only sending one signal that is controlled from the DSP into this, and then it's divided up into the two different speakers, I'm forced to control the time alignment to these as a total speaker. In other words, I can only control that one channel of time alignment. So I can't time align this tweeter that's in a different location separately from this woofer that's in a different location. So that would be an advantage of getting rid of the passive crossover and running active. The final disadvantage of using this passive crossover for your component set, and I've seen a lot of people complain about this, they'll complain about the tweeters being way too loud. And this is often based on the install location. They'll install them in a sail panel or something that's a little bit closer to your listening position, and they just feel like it's far too bright of a sound. It's really, really too high. The advantage of getting rid of this and connecting the tweeter directly to the amplifier is you could then adjust the level of this tweeter individually and you could tune it down so it's not as loud. But I will say that good crossovers like this particular one here, most of the time they'll have a nice little switch on it so you can actually attenuate the tweeter right within the crossover. So if you are shopping for a component set, definitely consider and see if the crossover has that tuning flexibility built into it. Another important thing to remember if you are going to run active and not be using this passive crossover, you definitely wanna check the direct speaker impedance of your speakers before connecting to your amplifier. Make sure that your amplifier is rated for that impedance. Another important thing to consider for the installation of a component set into your vehicle is whether or not your vehicle has the mounting locations already for these type of speakers. A lot of the newer vehicles are coming out with where they have a tweeter in the front A pillar of the vehicle, so that's an easy replacement. And as you know, there's likely going to be a location in the door for our mid woofers, but how do you know before you buy these speakers what's actually going to fit into your vehicle? For help with figuring out what speakers will fit into your vehicle, I definitely recommend that you check out my sponsor, Crutchfield. On Crutchfield's website, they have a vehicle selector that allows you to input the year, make, and model of your vehicle along with any factory car audio system options. They've done a ton of research, so they'll show you exactly which speakers will fit into your vehicle, and they also even have some handy pictures and things like that so that you can see what you're getting yourself.
yourself into. And not only that, when you buy a set of speakers from them, they offer discounts on the installation gear depending on the install. So you can get speaker adapters, the wiring harnesses, some of the different things that you actually need to install those speakers into the vehicle. To visit Crutchfield, check out the link down in the video description. So let's keep moving along here. I have a few tips of my own for selecting the right component speakers for you. So first of all, obviously, like I said, consider if they will fit. Crutchfield will help you with that. Now the second thing is power input to these speakers. I kind of touched on this earlier, but I definitely recommend that you get yourself an aftermarket amplifier. Now let's say that you're using a smaller power amplifier, so something that does uh, like 50 to 70 watts per channel. In that case, a good spec to look at to kind of compare component sets is the sensitivity. The higher the sensitivity value, generally the louder your speakers will be per that input power. So it kind of gives you a good way to compare between the different speakers. Now, if you are using an amplifier that has plenty of power, 100 watts plus RMS per channel, you can get away with using a lower sensitivity value as some of the other specs on these speakers will change with a lower sensitivity, making them actually perform a little Little bit better. Now something more advanced that you can look at for each of these speakers in order to compare them is the frequency response graph. As you can see on the graph, we get an idea what the output level is as we change frequency. So you kind of want to look for something that has a nice even flat response within the frequency range that you plan on running each of those speakers. Something else that is usually on this graph is the off-axis response, which means if that speaker isn't pointing directly at you, what that output level would be. Frankly, it's something that only a few manufacturers actually provide a graph for. I wish more manufacturers would, that way you could pair and combine different speakers on your own in order to determine what works best. But if you don't have a full understanding of that and you don't wanna go through all that effort, there's nothing wrong with using a component set that is designed to work together from the first place. Now, of course, you're also going to want to consider your budget. With car audio equipment, for the most part, I really do believe that you get what you pay for. Now, don't get me wrong, there are certain component sets that are definitely an exceptional value for their price range, but in my opinion, it's important to understand that speakers like this they cost more to manufacture than the actual raw materials that they're made out of. What I mean by this is there are companies that put years of engineering and research and development into coming up with a design of a new speaker. And that of course adds to the cost. In my opinion, all that R&D and engineering of course adds cost to the product, but it also results in a product that is better. But, but, Hold it right there, my friends. Just because you have more expensive speakers doesn't necessarily mean the sound is going to be better. You have to definitely consider the tuning of those speakers and you have to consider the installation. On the install side, things like sound treatment, speaker location, all critical and very important. And on the tuning side, understanding time alignment, crossover values, those sorts of things are also really important. You can check out a playlist up here to some other videos that will help you guys out. Thank you to Crutchfield for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to go check them out next time you need help with selecting your component speakers. You can visit them at crutchfield.com. Also, a special thanks to Bernard, John, Brian, Ali, Jeremy, Doug, Steve, Emmanuel, and Jerry, and the rest of the Patreon membership team. A big thanks to those guys for helping make these videos possible. Check out some of my other videos here on screen. As always, my friends, thank you guys for watching.